you fucked around. And now you're going to find out about the Extended Play Podcast with Ian Tank. Welcome to the Extended Play Podcast with Ian Tank. Today's topic is popularity. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, what makes music popular. Uh, We'll also talk about awards, uh, as they seem to be a way that um, popular culture measures the the popularity of music. And after all that, we will have a playlist challenge. I feel like you and I, Tank, have a a complicated relationship with the popularity of music. I think there are times when we are um, unabashedly fans of pop music, right? With like the most popular stuff out there. I think we, I know we've talked on the podcast before a number of times about the eighties and how, you know, you, yeah. you bought the Prince album, you bought the Madonna, whatever you're into it. I think that has changed as we've gotten older in terms of there aren't as many like icons of popular mm, music that, or that. And I just don't think we listen to what, you know, if you were to look at the billboard hot 100 or whatever it is, there's a very small chance that you, either you or I are listening to that. No, that, that's true. But, yeah. um, well, you know, on one hand, I guess I'm relatively proud that uh, at the ripe age of 46, I'm no longer listening to pop music. Yeah. Uh, right. Because it's not for you. Right. That, it, <laughs> that it's kind of, uh, it's, you know, it's kind of like uh, candy, right? And when you're young, yeah, you, you, you like can, candy. You can eat an infinite amount. Right. And then you get older and it's like, okay, you know, this is going to spike my glucose. <laughs> I got to, I got to take some pills That's now, right. take some water. That's right. Um, that I think actually it's twofold as to, you know, you know, a, we got older and, and hopefully got better taste or, or more refined palate. Yeah. More music. discerning. Sure. But also I just don't think that the, the popularity because of the overflow of information and options we have for entertainment, I don't think anyone reaches the heights anymore. I mean, yeah. Look at a Michael Jackson mm-hmm. thing, mm-hmm. Um, but don't go into his room. after. No, do not do, look. Or, don't don't yeah. actually look at Michael Jackson. No, don't, don't, <laughs> don't drink make the Jesus contact. juice. <laughs> Um, you know, it was Beatlesque, right? People Absolutely. passing out yeah, and all sure. kinds of stuff. Um, you know, and now people generally don't pass out unless they go to like a Travis Scott concert and they just die. Yeah, right. But yeah, it, it, you don't see that kind of mania necessarily. No. And, and, you know, again, to overuse the word icon, but you had the Prince, Madonna, Michael Jackson, Triumvirate. No one. Okay, well. Uh, ironically, as we record this, yes, absolutely, we should talk about. Uh, it. As uh, literally right now, as we are recording, uh, a one Taylor Swift is uh, performing down at Fort Field. Yeah, second of, second of two nights. Yep, yep. So she is kind of unique in that I think Taylor Swift, the Swifties, and where she is right now on yes. this tour, it's the first time I recall this kind of mass, uh, not mass, but uh, general mainstream, yeah, like universal, yes, approval. And, and right. adoration. Right. It's Taylor Swift is the, it is kind of an interesting case study. It's the first time since maybe the nineties. I feel like a pop star has galvanized yeah. the, the, the zeitgeist. Really? Of, it just, we haven't seen it. No. So it's kind of cool. I kind of like it actually. It, it is pretty neat that like, I always, I, I kind of judge popularity by sometimes I think, you know, I, I feel like I wear like liking things that are on the left of the dial as a, I wear it as like a badge of honor. And you then, don't some, say. yeah. <laughs> and then sometimes I think, <laughs> and then sometimes I think I'm listening to something. I'm like, oh, this is too pop or, or, and I, and I'll have a conversation with somebody about an artist and just assume that they know who this person is because I think they're relatively pop. And right. they look at me like I have, you know, three eyes. They're like, I have no idea who you're talking about. And we're and you're five degrees from where I would know the person you were talking about. Right. What I think is fascinating about Taylor Swift is this multi generational. Like I could go to my mom, who's in her seventies. She knows who Taylor Swift is. She could name multiple songs by Taylor Swift. And then my daughter, who is nine years old, could name multiple songs by Taylor Swift and, and likes her. And then everybody in between. It's right. pretty. You know, there, there's the multi generation. You know, I know like the old classic rock people that are touring, like the Who and stuff. They'll say you see multiple generations at the show, but I feel feel like a lot of times that's people dragging their kids right, right. or their grandkids with them, right. or they couldn't find a sitter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That is that is clearly not the case with Taylor Swift. It is everybody's excited about it. All three generations. Yeah, and it's kind of nice to see. I mean, it's something I thought we'd never see again. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I think even on this very podcast, uh, somewhere in season one, I, I bemoaned the demise of stadium acts. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that w- there are no current stadium acts. They're all nostalgia acts. And, well, that's that's an exception to the rule. It right is. There. It um, is. 
and good for her. And she deserves it. I mean, it's, it's, it's not my kind of music, but right. I can't deny the talent. I can't deny the appeal. Right. Seems to be a good person by all measures. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah does makes all the right moves. Yep. I mean, and just the, there's probably no better testament to her popularity than the fact that she's doing this thing where she's re-recording her albums, right? Because she lost the rights to them at some point. Mm-hmm. And she's just re-recording albums that she's already made. And people are going fucking crazy just by the announcing of an album that she's re-recording. People are losing their minds and like, right. can't wait to pre-order this this new old version of an album she made. Right. I mean, and that's doing, crazy. And doing the service to her of buying the new one that she gets the royalties on. And that's, you know what? Really good point too. They're buying it. Yeah. They're not just streaming it. Yeah. Her, like, so I often think as vinyl as sort of like a hipster type thing, and it definitely is. And Swifties buy records. Hmm. Her albums are the number one selling records. She makes sure to put up press vinyl every time she comes out with an album. She was the Record Store Day ambassador, I think, two years ago. I think Jason Isbell was actually this past year in Amanda Shires. Damn right. Yeah. Um, And she was like a, a year ago. But anyway... I went to Record Store Day this past year and stood in line. Taylor Swift's record was the first one to sell out. Yeah. And a, half the line walked away when the guy, a guy came out of the record store and said, hey, if anybody was waiting for the Taylor Swift album, it's already gone. And then the line halfway disappeared. And this is all, it's mostly people that look like me, to be honest. Right? Really? It, yeah, it, it was. It was a lot of older, like middle-aged white dudes. A fair amount of women, but regardless... They came out on yeah. like a Saturday at 8 a.m., 7 a.m. to stand in line to buy vinyl. As, as I understand it, a lot of them don't even have turntables. Right. And it's just for the merchandise and just to show how much they love her, yeah. which I think is fucking incredible. Yeah. It is a phenomenon, and I'm kind of happy that we still have phenomenons that are current and relevant. Although I, I would argue that the the list of pop stars, it starts and ends with Taylor Swift. I, it might. You know, we touched on it on the country episode. Morgan Wallen, unfortunately, mm-hmm. frequently tops the charts yeah. of, of popular music, but yeah. it's not pop. I no. mean, well, it is and it isn't. I mean, R- go, go back and listen to the country episode. Yeah, right. Um, generally, it's it's a lot of, you know, there's some god-awful hip-hop, but they... Yeah. they Maybe Beyonce? Okay, and of course, it's pop, right? Yeah. But I feel like it's been a while since she's had something out. She's but. on tour right now, but it has been a while since she's had okay. something out. You're right. Yeah. Uh, money grab. Um, <laughs> the, but you know, it's just, it's, I guess back in the day we could point to all kinds of, when I say back in the day, I guess refer to the eighties for us where like, what was Huey Lewis in the news? They weren't, they, yeah. they were a pop. It was rock, but it was pop. It was like the Thompson twins and oh, fucking yeah. like everyone was a pop act. It was. And the, I guess that's what doesn't, I don't know that we really have that anymore. It's just, we have all the genres and some of them happen to kind of bubble up to the top, but very, Few are out and out popular music acts. Yeah, that is very strange. I and I the... tell you one thing: I did not wake up this morning and think that we were going to spend ten minutes of our podcast meet writing Taylor Swift. But yeah. here we are. No shit. Yeah. Honestly, especially considering what I've said about her in the past. But yeah, yeah. But you know what she deserves. And uh, and hey, Swifties, uh, nothing but love. Absolutely, we love you. Do not attack us. There's <laughs> no. There's few things I fear more in this world than the wrath of the Swifties. <laughs> Please like and subscribe while you're yeah. at it. <laughs> hashtag hashtag Taylor Swift. <laughs> Uh, uh, and you know, another thing I really appreciate about, wow, this really is becoming like a glowing, <laughs> a glow up, uh, not a glow up. It's becoming a, a Taylor Swift thing, but she is really good about, um, I think they refer to it as signal boosting people that are people that she likes mm-hmm. that aren't necessarily on her superstardom level. So mm-hmm. she brought Phoebe Bridgers on this tour, which I think is really? fucking awesome. Yeah. Yes. Because she's just left of the dial from she's you know there are some songs that are pretty pop and it's perfect for her i think she's going to gain millions and millions of fans from this and she deserves it because she's super talented and but she's still doing something unique it's like this perfect storm for her um she recorded taylor swift did like the last two or three albums with uh one of the guys from the national and she's on the nationals last record right, and when i have it and she's on tour saying and she brings dude out to and so play, is, and play so the is piano. Phoebe Bridgers. Phoebe Bridgers was as well. Yeah, it's huh. kind of a whole thing. A little, little triangle there. Yeah. Um, I'd like to be in that triangle. <laughs> Not with the national guy, though. I mean, I he's mean, handsome. I mean, you're right. Look, he does if, seem like a bummer. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's like, dude, stop moping and, you know, finish me or something, you know? Jesus. But no, so right away at the beginning of this new this tour, she said, the, new, the Nationals' new album came out today. I'm on it. 
but don't buy it because I'm on it. I listen to it. It's an amazing album. These people are great. This guy helped me write the last two albums. Hmm. That's fucking awesome. Yeah. You don't have to do any of that, which yeah. uh, it's just great. Yeah. So the, the whole notion of popularity generally, though, like and pop and music, I think it's it, we're in a weird time with pop music. Like you were just saying about like Huey Lewis or someone like Cindy Lauper. Like it's hard to point to pop as a genre, right? It's like... Because if you looked at the pop charts, I would imagine you've got a, a whole mix of weird stuff. You've got country, you've got right. um, Latin Latin artists, uh, you know, doing all sorts of different kind of music. Um, you've got hip hop. You've got you don't have any rock. <sighs> yeah, tell me about it. I mean, that's not pop. Rock is not pop music anymore. No, well, not for now, right? It always comes. It always comes. Hundred um, percent. You know, I think it might have something to do with that accessibility that I alluded to earlier. That mm. mm-hmm. today, there's everything's instantly available. Right. Right. If you go back to the eighties, it, you know, we talked about how the, the, the oversized influence MTV had. Yeah. So if you take MTV and radio, that was it. That was it. That's your only two ways. And both of them were probably heavily influenced by cocaine wielding A&R guys. Right. Absolutely. Payola. Payola. Yeah. So that's probably, maybe that's the answer to our question, right? Mm-hmm. It's that it's the democratization of yeah. the music that right. there's no need for pop anymore. It's just, everyone does their genre and the best becomes the pop music. But right. Whereas maybe before things were a bit more forced and manufactured. Right. Um, not in the case of Prince. Prince was just so transcendent. He ended up. Sure. Right. Yeah. But you know, your Madonna's obviously were, you yeah. Know, uh, manufactured. Like there were focus way. groups and stuff. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But it, what, it, what, what it's also done is it's, there's no way for the fan base to sort of, this is why the Taylor Swift thing is so impressive to galvanize around a single artist. If, mm-hmm. if the play playing field is much more level, you've got, super fans of many, many, many different groups. You don't have these sort of ones that rise to the top, right? right. Where you don't ever reach critical mass. So right. there's there's tons of stuff that is popular, but there's not a pop music anymore. And I was uh, uh, discussing this with your beautiful wife, actually, oh, er- thanks. earlier today. Um, <laughs> about how, but with, with Taylor Swift, going into a minute 16 of the Taylor Swift podcast, um, the, the, the popularity now has gotten to the point where going to this concert tonight is a kind of like having the latest handbag or yes, it is. It's reached a critical mass. Like you yes. said, where people who aren't even maybe her fans want to get tickets to yes. put on Instagram. I got Taylor it Swift has, tickets. That's social currency. Yes, absolutely. Exactly. So it, it's gone beyond the music now to be like, I want to be part of the in crowd. Right. Wow. Isn't that crazy to think? Yeah. Which again, I'm I, I kind of in a weird way. I'm happy about it. Well, yeah, because when we were kids, we talked about this identifying with a genre that we were, we were into that. We wanted to, we built our identities around a genre and that that's part of what we wanted to do. We wanted to wear the Iron Maiden t-shirt or wear mm-hmm. the public enemy t-shirt to say, I'm part of this group. I want you to ask me about it. And that's what's going on here, right? It's like, mm-hmm. I want to be part of this larger discussion. And I would, I would like the listening audience to know that for a fact, for my eighth grade class photo, <laughs> I wore a Megadeth t-shirt. Amazing. Yeah. We need to post that in the socials if we can find yeah, that. Yeah, I'm sure it's somewhere. Oh, but that's yeah. great. Yep. I knew it was photo day. People are going to think, oh yeah, you just didn't know. You got, no, no, no. I knew. Yeah. I knew. And you'll be able to tell it's photo day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> They'll have the very distinct background. Yes. And, right. That, uh, that kind of nauseating blue. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So in a little bit of like background reading and research, I, I, I did um, going back to one of those books I was reading recently, um, this notion of pop music. So it seems like I read about this thing called the novelty popularity curve, which is essentially a bell curve. And take it this way is that I'll describe it for you as best I can. On the x-axis, you've got from the familiar on the far left to the novel on the far right. And the y-axis at the bot, the y-axis is record sales from low to high. And you've got a bell curve. And on the left of the bell curve is classic music. This is what the author is arguing. This is someone who's done, this is a record producer and a neuroscientist who have partnered up to write a book. Hmm. Okay. Um, and the book is called This Is What It Sounds Like. It's called This Is What It Sounds Like because she was the producer for Prince. Oh, yeah. And she worked with a neuroscientist to talk about what, you know, the way music works in our brains. Classic music on the left of the scale, the left bottom of the chart. (laughs) Classic music is like nursery rhymes and um, things that everybody's familiar with, like jingles. So when you say classic, you mean classic. You you already said familiarity. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Right. It's things that everybody know. Right. Everybody knows. Um, on the far right would be things considered art music. So anything outside of where you'd have to be in a sort of niche group to, to appreciate it. Like Kid Rock. <laughs> I don't know what group you're part of to be able to appreciate Kid Rock. <laughs> I think they have to make a whole separate chart for uh, that. Nazi party? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Nailed it. <laughs> 
Um, but that that pop music is that top of the bell curve, right? Where it's the the it has to hit that sweet spot between familiarity and novelty, which I thought was you know it seems relatively obvious, but it wasn't to me at first that that there is a sweet spot. People do actually not want something so incredibly familiar. It's like a nursery rhyme, right? right. They, they need some of that, right? But they also needed to be pushing towards novelty a little bit. Right. They want derivative, but they don't want to copy. Yes. Yes. And and the authors talk a little bit about how that bell curve just keeps it keeps sliding towards novel. So the people at the at the peak who are making pop music, somebody out there in the pop world will do something slightly novel. Mm-hmm. And then everybody else will pretty much catch up to that right away. And so it keeps sliding towards novel, but but it's always this bell curve, which I thought was kind of fascinating. Like yeah, I've got a completely unfounded theory. Sure. That me. maybe some of the ways that, that manifests itself is in pop stars looking more and more fucked up. Look at Post Malone's face. All right. Do and, I have to? Well, <laughs> I mean, know. no, it's, I mean, there's For a the lot benefit of the show. There's a lot going on. Right. Um, great guy though, by the way, I, uh, everything I see about I agree. him, I love him more and I more, know. but, but, or this, uh, Takashi six, nine oh, or geez. not a great guy. <laughs> no, no, no. A little one eighty there, but, but you know, is it coincidence then that with what you just said, hmm. that, Okay, if you if I if I did a graph of oh. top ten artists with face tattoos, yeah, it would be a pretty much a vertical fucking line somewhere around five years ago. Yeah, I just wonder how much of this exoticness is okay, not just the music, but my presentation, my brand, my character has to be more fucking crazy than it was before. It's just something a little to push it a little further down the line yeah. because pop because um, Post Malone's making pop music, right? Exactly. Essentially, right? right? Like he's he's appealing to that right. meaty part of the curve, and and left without crazy fashion or tattoos, he would just be like a pudgy middle aged guy yeah. making. Oh, that's but, interesting. Yeah, I just wonder if that has a. If you can't be novel with the music, you're novel with your presentation. Interesting. And does that does that satisfy that thirst? Because zero people are turned off. There's nobody's like I like this Post Malone song, but I, but I saw him and I'm turned off by it, and I'm not going to listen to him. Right? right? It, 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 right. They take it all. Right? right. Uh, huh. Yeah, just a thought. Yeah, I never thought of that. Yeah, but anyway, so so I thought the chart was interesting, particularly as it relates to album sales, right? And that's what pop music, I mean, really, if you think about it, there's pop music in, in, you can describe pop music by a sound that I think we all kind of have in our head. And then there's just popularity. What is selling the most albums or whatever has the most streams, however you want to measure it. In a recent episode, we were talking about um, nostalgia, nostalgia's role in our appreciation for music. And like, is it possible that we... Uh, hold certain songs in, uh, higher up in our appreciation for them because they were wrapped around a certain moment in time, um, even if the song was maybe not even that great. And in retrospect, like listening to it now, you're like, this is actually not a great song at all. I think you even brought a few of those up where you're like, mm-hmm. you have distinct memories about a song you don't even like no. from certain time periods. Another thing I, I think I brought up was this strange experience of like, we lived a certain life music wise when we were kids and in our formative years. And we do now as well, where we only, we sort of have blinders on to what we like. And we, we stretch our, you know, we look for things that might not right be in our wheelhouse all the time, but you know, in the eighties, like I said earlier, we were much more into sort of the mainstream pop things we liked were on MTV. We weren't, I think I mentioned before, well, it's chicken or the egg, right? Oh, Okay. Good point. Right. Like, yeah. Did we like it? Cause it was on MTV. It, it, it was a good chance. And it, at that age with that technology, what re what recourse did we have if we didn't like it? Right. Yeah. Good point. Pre-internet. Yeah. I just think about it in terms of, so, you know, like when I'm reading the music blogs and stuff and they'll talk about uh, a new artist or even an established artist wearing a certain uh, influence on their sleeve. And they'll say, these people are clearly takes on, they clearly have Husker do and television as their influences. And I'm sitting there reading that. And after, you know, the first time you're like, uh, I'm not, I don't have the time to go look up these bands. But then after a certain amount of time, you're like, I guess I got to do my homework and right. figure out who these people are. Right. And then you discover that during your childhood, there was a whole alternate timeline where mm-hmm. like you could have been going to replacement shows or right. Husker Du shows. Uh, I think that is fascinating that for whatever reason, we just didn't go that route. And maybe some of our listeners are people that went that route. Mm-hmm. I'd be fascinated to hear like, are you the people that when we talk about more left of the dial stuff that you're into it versus the, the, the whole bit about Taylor Swift we just did? I mean, I'm somewhat proud that I think my first concert was Iron Maiden and I went because Anthrax was opening. Oh, cool. And I was 14. Wow. So, I, you know, I, I, 
I got onto my thing relatively early. Okay. And, and to, to add on to that uh, point you made earlier about the blinders and, and being in our lane, what I think we both take some pride in is it's an effort to keep pushing those out, right? Yes, it is. In the absence of effort, those will get narrower and narrower. That's true. Until you find yourself listening to like the same three artists your entire That's life. That's exactly right. So especially as we get older, life gets more chaotic, responsibilities pile up. It's harder and harder to put the energy in to do it. Yeah. But it's it's incumbent on you to do it if you really want to get the most out of music. Yeah, because otherwise you're going to the Billy Joel show. Which, you know, nothing wrong with Billy Joel. There's nothing wrong with it. But what I'm saying is it's so comforting. He hasn't made music in, maybe he has, but no one cares about it. Right. (laughs) But that's what I mean. Like, (laughs) that's another thing you see on social media. It's like, oh, we went to the Billy Joel Elton John show. It's like, well, you don't care. Like you've definitely had it. been. It's been narrowed by now, I would imagine. You're not also going to that and and going to a fucking hardcore show or something, I would guess. You never know. Maybe. (laughs) Yeah, no, it's, I see your point, but it's, uh, it's something that I think can be, it's a condition that can be reversed, right? If yeah. you put the effort in. Yeah. And I guess that's kind of some of the preaching and the uh, evangelizing we're trying to do. I here, agree. Right? I was just going to say that. Is keep pushing. Yeah. That's what, part of why we do the playlist challenge and other things is uh, just you never know what's out there yeah. unless you keep looking. Absolutely. So I did a little research into uh, just thinking about this notion of popularity in this alternate timeline, Ian Tank. And uh, I was curious about this these formative years in the 80s when we were... Tank and I were both born in 1976, which you can do the math there. So the the very end of the 80s, we're 13 years old in 1989, right? So the 80s is very much a formative time for our music taste. And so I was looking at thinking of like, well, what would I have been in if I wasn't into the popular stuff? And uh, this is probably not the best way to look at this, but this is the way I chose is I thought I'd look at the top 20 albums of the 80s according to popularity, like album sales, which would mean pop music, which was hard to find, by the way, but I, I'll, I'll get into that in a second. The top 20 albums of the 80s, according to Rolling Stone, which I think is, for years, was the authority mm-hmm. on what was popular in, uh, in all things music, really. And then the top 20 albums of the 80s, according to Pitchfork, which wasn't around in the 80s, which I should note, like they weren't a publication in the 80s. So this is all in retrospect. Okay, so let me, I don't need to read, read them all verbatim, but I can name, if I name the albums, you think you name the artists? Uh, oh, sure. I mean, bring it. all of them. Bring it. Yeah, let's go. Let's do it. All right. Okay. And by the way, and so as a, maybe as a way to yeah. uh, crib note, this would be maybe who we were into if we were magically 10 years older. Mm-hmm. Right. If, right. If we ended that decade, it's 23 instead of 13. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right, here we go. So this is live people not rehearsed. I have not seen his notes. Okay. So we'll start with, what do you want to start with the most popular or the least popular? Well, you know, surprise me. Okay. Let's start with the least popular. All right. Not least popular, but the more fringe, more mm-hmm. whatever. So that's Pitchfork. Okay. So we'll do uh, we'll do number 10. So the number two, 10 album is an album called Diamond Life. I don't know this album. Sade? It is Sade. Yeah. Okay. Hold on. Right. <laughs> Finally, a use for these drops. There you go. Wait, All right. Well done. Uh, okay. Number nine, Disintegration. The Cure. Yep. Number eight, Control. Janet Jackson. Nailed it. Number seven, Daydream Nation. Ooh. Kid Rock. <laughs> <laughs> well, nicely played. Thank you. Sonic Youth. Ah, fuck. Yeah. All right. Uh, number six, it takes a nation of millions to hold us back. back. Public Enemy. Yep. Number five, Remain in Light. Talking Heads. Yep. Number four, Hounds of Love. You say that with an intonation like it's obvious to you. It's obvious to you. You'll be mad that you don't know it. Uh, but I'm not saying I don't. You'll Alvi- be mad if you don't know it. I apologize. Elvis Costello? No. <laughs> Kate Bush. Oh. Because you just talk, you've talked about yeah, her a couple I times know, on the podcast. I know. Yeah. All right. Uh, three straight out of Compton. NWA. Yeah. Two Thriller. Kid Rock. <laughs> <laughs> One Purple Rain. Yeah. Okay. All yeah. right. Okay. So I think I got what seven of them or something. Yeah. Pretty yeah. good. All right. So that's uh, and, and out of those. So how many of those albums did you own or listen to a lot at the time? <sighs> a lot of them. I mean, half maybe, of maybe half of them. Yeah. I mean, not Sade. Not Sade. Seems like you, would, you just talked about Sade in a previous I know. episode. I mean, yeah, I know. But um, but I mean, albums, you know. Yeah, Lo- sure. Lover's Rock. Look, yeah. I can you know, right. talk about that all day. Is that later Sade? Is the- of course. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. Lover's Rock is like 2000s. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, no, I mean, obviously the... Uh, the per- yeah. I mean, we can go through it again, but I think maybe six or seven of those yeah. I, I have. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, same here. And 
and since then, you know, I've, I think we've gone back and made sure that we know somewhat, at least a little bit about, like, I know we didn't, like, we knew Talking Heads, but it was ever whatever Talking Heads was on the radio, mm-hmm. which was from um, this uh, album, not from Remain in Light. Might have been. Really? I feel like Burning Down the House. Is... Was, in, was on Remain in Light? Yeah. Okay. Uh, anyway, okay. So, and anyway, I think just a fun exercise. Do you have another list? At. Yeah, I do. All right, let's, let's do, do it. it. Right, okay. So, the Rolling Stone top oh, albums fuck. of the 1980s. All right, let me guess. Number one's Marvin Gaye. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty sure he was dead by the eighties, but the, the, right? well, was he killed so in stop Rolling Stone. <laughs> uh, number ten, um, you'll have a hard time with this album. Tracy Chapman. <laughs> you know what I was about to say, but Tracy Chapman. All right. Uh, number nine, uh, shoot out the lights. Mm. That's the reaction I had. Shoot out the lights. Uh, Stray Cats. Richard and Linda Thompson. Who the fuck is Richard Linda? I don't. I know the name. They names. sound like a realtor team. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do not know. I know the wow. names. I do not know the music. Wow. Yeah, for Rolling Stone, that was that pretty sounds ballsy. Made up. Yeah. yeah. Um, eight murmur. Oh, uh, R.E.M. Yep. Seven thriller. Michael Jackson. Yep. Six born in the USA. Springsteen. Yep. Five Graceland. Uh, Paul Simon. Mm-hmm. Four remain in light. Talking heads. Mm-hmm. Three, the Joshua Tree. You two. Two, Purple Rain. Prince. One, London Calling. Clash. Yep. So, little, you can clearly see, like, with the addition of, like, Springsteen and maybe Paul Simon, that this is definitely a little more pop, right? This is more, maybe we knew more of these albums than you did. What was the first one? What was the first one again? Pitch- Tr- Tracy Chapman. No, no, no. I'm sorry. The uh, Which publication was the first one? First one was Pitchfork. Oh. Huh. Man, I would have thought you would have swapped those two, to be honest. Oh, okay. Because Pitchfork, I think, would avoid the obvious choices. Right. Like Prince and Michael Jackson at all costs. Well, I think that is a discussion we should have. We should put a, you know. Yeah, because Pitchfork, in that. If, uh, if some fucking, uh, you know, some fucking hippie farts into a microphone and then moans for 20 minutes, they say that's the best album ever recorded and you just don't get it. And- Dude, generally, like, think of like Daniel Johnston. And I know I'm going to piss people off by saying that if you know who he is, but. I don't even know who oh, he is. Oh, okay. So the, uh, I can't even get into it. Anyway, uh, he's, he's this ma- he was, he passed away, I think, fair, fairly recent in the last few years. He's this sort of man child who clearly had like cognitive issues and recorded stuff in his bedroom or his kitchen or whatever. He had an incredibly high pitched voice where he sounded like a child. And it was like this folky, weird ass stuff that is generally rec- like recognized as amazing. And I don't fucking get it. I feel like. Yeah. It's just so you can say, I like weird shit. Okay, it's like yeah. a badge of honor. That and we will, we will go into that in, in depth later in this episode when yeah. we talk about rock critics. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so then top selling albums. So then this is this is really when you get into what pop music is. It's what people actually buy. And All in right. the 80s, they were buying it. They okay. weren't streaming it. So how, how about this? How about we flip the script? Sure. I'm going to guess them. Oh, I love it. And you tell me if it's on the list or not. So now I only have... Uh, because I couldn't find good statistics, I could only find the top selling albums each year. So I have the top selling albums for 1980 right. through 89. You know what? You know what? I'm I'm, I'm gonna give this a shot. I love right. it. Okay, I'm, I am going to go year by year. Incredible. Yeah, let's. Do I mean, this. and over under, I'm gonna get three right. Three it, because the actual year if, as well. Okay, but right. I, you definitely get half credit if you name within a year or two. Y- yeah, yeah, yeah. Or if you name it at all, I think if, sure. it's, if it's on this list. Okay. All right. All right. This is uh, 1980. All right. I don't know if this is exciting for people at home, but it's, it's a lot of fun it's for pretty us. Pretty thrilling, yeah. All right. Yeah. No fun intended. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 1980 best selling album. 1980. That's like the end. That could be almost disco. Um, oh, fuck. Um, I'm going to say Donna Summer. Wow. Incorrect. Okay. Mm. It's The Wall. Oh. Okay, makes sense. I would have guessed 79, 78. Okay, no. Okay. It probably came out then, but it might have been the best. You know, this could be a del- on a delay. Right. Right? A, a fair warning, the, the beginning of the 80s. Remember, I was fucking, I was still shitting myself at this point in time. So, <laughs> well, I mean, you know, uh, I mean, very little has changed in, right, that's that, true. in that way, but yeah, it's just a matter of frequency. Uh, <laughs> all right, so 81. Um, I mean, the, fir- the first half is going to be rough, uh, first few years. As we know, the 80s really didn't get underway until the mid 80s. <laughs> we've been firmly established. Yeah, we've, I mean, that's canon at this point. <laughs> uh 81 fuck it let's say um fucking like how about kansas or some oh really close i think that you're thinking the right way no but you're thinking the right way what is it 
Uh, the album's called High Infidelity. I've never, what? Not, yeah, I've never heard of that name of the album. The, the band is REO Speedwagon. Oh, I was close then. Yeah. All right. Okay. Okay, okay. good. 82. Now we're, we're getting closer. So 82. I'll give you a hint. Keep going where you were going. Think, uh, okay, so yeah. I'm going to go with Toto. Incorrect, but Can- about as close as you can get. Kansas? No. <laughs> uh, no, don't tell me. Um, Kansas, Toto, they're all, they're all the fucking same. All right, tell me. Asia. Asia. <laughs> All right. Okay, now, 83. Yes. Thriller. Yes. Okay. Nailed it. 84, Purple Rain. Incorrect. What? Okay, Like a Virgin. Incorrect. Fuck you. <laughs> uh, I didn't buy these albums. I was... Thriller? Like a Virgin? Seven. Oh, oh. Uh, Born in the USA? Incorrect. <laughs> Fuck you. Uh, You're going to be so mad. Uh, is it a soundtrack? No. All right. Well, I guess it is a future year. So you no. don't tell me? No. Okay, what is it? It's thr- Thriller again. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> All right. That's, uh, that's bullshit. Fuck you. All right. Okay. I did Eight. not sign up for this level of abuse, by the way. I well, mean, I'm just... Uh, I'm just... I do cunt. all the research. You get to cuss yeah. me out? Okay. Yeah, exactly. It's fine. All right. Uh, so two... Okay, so 85. 85. Uh, I'm going to say Like a Virgin again. Incorrect. Um... <sighs> You've mentioned it already, incorrectly. Um, Prince. This makes great radio, by the way. It does. Long Uh, pauses. (laughs) A lot of editing. (laughs) Um, Which one was it? Which one did I say? What do you mean? 85, you said I already said it. Born in the USA. Oh, okay. Yeah. Eh, Half credit. Yep. 86. Sign of the Times? No. (sighs) Whitney Houston. Oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. 87. Uh, 87. What? did madonna have after it's not madonna okay um one of these has to be prince it's not not for top selling album of yeah, that yeah. particular year yeah but I, th- I felt like you know he had a bunch of hits in that um because I, I mean i know bad obviously it's 88 89 it's one of those i think it's 88 though okay so we eight, need an answer we need an answer uh uh fucking bon jovi yes all right which album um Slippery one what? Nailed it. All right. Well done. It's too man. early for New Jersey. That was impressive. <laughs> Thank you. I pulled that one out of my ass. Uh, so then 88 bad? No. 89 then is bad. It is not. Fuck. All right. 88. 89. Okay. 89. I'm saying like a prayer. No. <laughs> Let's stick with 88. All right. 88. Great year for music. 1988. By it the was. Way. Oh my God. Yeah. Um, all right. Give me a hint. Uh, it's a solo recording artist that you really appreciate. And you've talked about in the podcast before <laughs> Has two first names. Oh, George Michael. Yeah. Faith. Faith. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Ah, uh, that's see that's, that's, I should have known that. Yeah. 89 last one. It's not bad. It's not bad. Control. No, the, uh, I can't believe you could possibly answer this correctly. Okay. Uh, go ahead then. Don't be cruel. Well, who, who even is that? Bobby Brown. Oh, really? <laughs> Wow. I don't know. I maybe I might have looked at the wrong list, but yeah. I, I believe it. He sold a lot of records. The, that that record was on the radio yes. all the time. I have to imagine that Bad somehow straddled eighty eight, eighty nine. Mm-hmm. It was second both mm-hmm. years. That's possible. Right. Anyway, my point being here <laughs> that uh, uh, you know, long way to get to, a, to my point is that popularity doesn't have any real <laughs> connection to what critics. You know, there there is there is a there is a connection to a certain extent of what people actually buy and invest their money into, and what critics say is good or the best. Mm-hmm. In this list that I just read, Thriller and Born in the USA are the only one only albums that made it into the top top twenty. Actually, I went I drilled down for Rolling Stone and Pitchfork top twenty, and th- those were the only two that made it. So nowhere on that list, uh, Def Leppard, Poison, Motley Crue, Rat. I think Def Leppard. Def Leppard's the only one that surprises me yeah. because all the other ones you mentioned yeah. are, you know, like rat was not in that same stratosphere. No, they weren't. Um, but I'm actually surprised that, uh, hysteria is hysteria in the eighties. Hysteria, Yes. It was 88. It sold or 87. That had a shit ton of album. Dude, hysteria. I didn't have like seven singles. I was going to say <laughs> that album had like nine songs and seven were singles. It's crazy. There were only two random ass songs that weren't. 
Oh, wow. And Rocket. That's a great fuck. I'm going to listen. Don't, I don't like Rocket. Oh, dude, just. I, all right. I, I like a lot of that but, album. Sorry, I don't like Rocket. Right. Big well, deal. Then, you know, it's all right. I like, and I don't like, oh, no, what's the slowest one? Maybe I don't, maybe Rocket, I don't mind. It's the slow one. I don't like. Love, Love Bites. Bites. I don't like Love Bites. No, Love Bites was like Shelby Junior High Dance, you know. Oh, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Looking for your sweetie. Oh, yeah. Man. Bad times. Mm. <laughs> Animal's a good song. Animal's a great song. Mm-hmm. That was the first single, I feel like, and it undersold yeah. the rest of the album. Yeah. It's a great song, but mm-hmm. who knew what was to come after <laughs> that? Who knew, man? Pyromania, I have that vine, that album. Pyromania mm-hmm. is fucking fantastic. It's right. a whole different thing. Right. It's way more classic rock, but mm-hmm. the riffs are incredible. Mm-hmm. No, but I mean, Bon Jovi was on, or no, Bon Jovi wasn't on the list, was it? They were. They were. They That's were. Right. Yeah. Um, Poison doesn't really surprise me. Okay. But um, I think I just added those because that's what we were listening to. And it seemed super popular. Yeah, in a way. Right? Yeah. But it's not critically popular and album sales, they weren't up there, which is, I don't know. It just goes to show like, I okay, let, yeah. me, let me ask you this. Yeah. <laughs> and may, maybe this will be a follow up for the next episode or something. So what you did, what you had there were record sales in that year. Yes. What it will be a fascinating comparison yeah. is album now now we can go find what albums have the highest album sales that were released in that year oh interesting in other words i vir- since, so since then right so i vir- i will virtually guarantee that something like maybe not for some of those mega albums but we talked about in metallica like a master yeah. of puppets was released in 1986 yeah in 1986 okay it probably had gold at best yeah but it hasn't stopped selling in 35 well, 40 should, years by 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 that notion the eagles Exactly. Right. Even though it came out in the seventies, right. It would be up there. Yeah. That's a good point. No, but there are, there is, it's interesting how some things, I guess maybe that it speaks to the uh, ephemeral nature of popularity that Mm -hmm. in, in 89, it was Bobby Brown, but I guarantee 10 albums have probably surpassed it. That were released in 89. Sure. That, yeah, you know no, what? That makes sense. You know what? I'm going to make that my little homework assignment. Okay. I'm going right. to go find albums released in 89 All right. and uh, do a little list, but I bet Bobby Brown is not even in the top 10. Yeah. No, I believe that. I yeah. don't believe that. That's crazy. Damn, there was some good music in the late 80s, early 90s. Also some bad. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, you know, speaking of late 80s and uh, my go-to uh, depth of knowledge on all things Metallica, which is where I always end up whenever I have to go to some sort of <laughs> well-crafted point, <laughs> um, awards. And when I think of awards with regards to music, I think, you know, of the Grammys, like most people do. Mm-hmm. And I always go back to the infamous Jethro Tull incident. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Right, where uh, I think it was 88. Okay. And Justice for All comes out. Uh-huh. And they literally created the category to give them the award. It was the first year of the Hard Rock Heavy Metal Grammy. Oh, my God. So there was, you know, we, we talked about it before, how one just kind yeah, of was a watershed was moment, right? Yeah. And so they make the award, and it was a classic example of the old fogeyism in mm-hmm. the voting mm-hmm. populace of the Grammys. They make the category, they nominate a Justice for All, and then it loses to Jethro Tull. To Jethro Tull. Yeah. Um, Who was 20 years past when yeah. anybody knew a no. Jethro Tull song at and, that point. And then in a pathetic makeup attempt, the next year, Metallica won the Grammy for Stone Cold Crazy, their Queen cover. Oh, jeez. Which on. is just, yeah. again, so I guess that's a good way to start my uh, beef, for lack of a better word, with the Grammys, that right from the start, with with... When I started paying attention to music and I started caring about who won mm-hmm. back when it, when, yeah, back when the Grammys had some semblance of mattering, right? Yeah. I think most people listening to this can probably in their mind's eye remember the picture of Michael Jackson and his blue sequin, absolutely fucking get up yeah. holding that like a baby, an armful of like 10 right, Grammys, right? right? So, Announcing that he was the king of pop, I think, on right. one of those, right? Yeah. So the Grammys were a, everyone watched it, everyone talked about it the absolutely. next day big cultural touchstone and winning one was a big deal that made a career for sure. And we obviously, you know, podcast and all love music. These days, the Grammys will come and go and I have no idea they have absolutely right. And then I will go back and retroactively get angry. I will go back and look at the categories and be like, okay, this is why I don't even pay attention anymore. Right. right. But I think, you know, going back to 1989, which is again, when I probably started to care and root for certain uh, artists, Uh It was a joke from the beginning. Not only do you not give it to an artist, which obviously deserved it, but then the next year you give a makeup award. But what about all the artists that put out music that year? Right, right, right. Good so point. Yeah. From the start, it's like you write one wrong, but then you just make another wrong because yeah. someone probably put out a great rock or metal album in 1989. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. 
And would you say like in those years, in the eighties, nineties, whatever, that the, they were sort of a reward for popularity, these, these awards? Cause it, they weren't, they weren't critical, right? It's not like these were critics picks, but they weren't quite people's choice either. They were, they're in some weird, right. weird in between place. Exactly. Yeah. They're in this weird purgatory. Of, yeah. It, it's funny. Maybe that's why they're so antagonistic because they maybe. don't really make anyone happy. Yeah. That's probably true. They don't cater. Now the American music awards were pure popularity. Right. Oh, okay. You're right. right. Okay. Um, and I believe those even had a component of album sales. Oh, okay. I, I, I think those were, there was some degree of objectivity to those. Okay. Um, yeah, the Grammys, maybe that was part of the problem is they tried to please both sides, ended up pissing off everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Um, even if the Grammys were a, uh, a critic based reward, yeah, they were 10 years too late. Okay. Right? They, they were never, they were... The, the, whatever it is, whether it's their me, the members of uh, NARAS or the rules that they have, yeah. they could never catch things when they were actually no, good. No, they couldn't. Yeah. And so then what you had was, there, there was also this phase, right? Um, I think the last time I was really paying any attention to the Grammys, where they were, perp- I feel like they were getting antagonistic with their choices of best album. This is when, this is the year they're choosing like Tony Bennett unplugged as the best album, like album of the year or Arcade Fire when nobody when like a Beyonce album came out that year right. where like it's, you're just, now you're just want to get in the public conversation. You just want to have people angry right. about your choices. And the other thing is giving multiple awards to the same band because, Oh yeah. Let's say that, Cold, that let's say Coldplay puts out a good album. Mm-hmm. They can give Coldplay maybe best rock song. And then they give someone else best rock performance, best rock album. No headline. If Coldplay wins seven Grammys. Yeah. Headline. That seemed to be, I remember that trend. It's like Alicia Keys won 15 Grammys this exactly. year or so-and-so won 15. Yeah, right. Okay. Exactly. Oh. So I, I think that they, when they started to lose their hold on America's attention, yeah, they, they, they start flailing even more and say, what will get attention? Not just what's the best music, what will get attention? Right. It's, it's so bizarre. Mm-hmm. But I think, you know, you can see a direct correlation between the popularity of these award shows and the, the whole, our previous notion of what pop music is, yeah. like kind of going away. Like yeah. as these, as these shows, have, uh, as the popularity has gone way down, there's no such thing as pop music anymore, as we were saying. You know, that's another, I feel like there is a gigantic, um, of course, I'm probably biased because I, you know, the, the way we think about music. Yeah. There's a gigantic opportunity for someone to make a new award or a new hall of fame that has credibility yeah. and people and re kind of reestablish the excitement and honor around it. Right. Cause there isn't one right now. No. What music award do you give someone that means a shit? Yeah. No. Movies still have it, right? Oscars still sort of mean something. They do. Emmys still mean something. They do. Grammys don't mean anything. No, they don't. That's really disappointing, but I don't know if that's because of the award. I, I part. I partly think people just don't care about music. As much well, anymore. go back to episode one, right? Um, I mean, because yeah. I've I know I've personally watched, and I didn't watch it when it happened, but like I've watched, I watched The Cure get inducted by Trent Reznor, mm-hmm. and it was super moving. I watched, uh, I watched a few of them. I went down a rabbit hole and watched a bunch of induction ceremonies. I watched um, Def Leppard get inducted by I don't know somebody awesome, and I don't know. It was really moving. It was really cool, and the mm-hmm. and I, I don't know. I found I found it really entertaining, but maybe. The, the because ceremony, I'm old and I remember these bands from right, when they well, were making albums. The, the ceremony itself is great. And actually the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, that I do love the way that they they go about the actual induction of the ceremony. Okay. I'm talking about what the way they make their choices. Oh, I see. The, there are great bands that never make it, get yeah. included way too late. Yeah. It, it seems like there's years, because they only do like five a year or so. Yeah. And there's some years where they're clearly meeting a quota or they're just, of like, stuffing in a bunch of blues artists exactly. or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. And when I get there, I remember being very underwhelmed by the actual hall of fame. Yeah. It there's, was. there's just not much there. I feel like I saw more interesting shit in a random hard rock. No kidding. Then. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I haven't been a year. I probably haven't been in 20 years, yeah. but uh, that's unfortunate. Yeah. And now it's time for a playlist challenge. Uh, I got to choose the topic this time around, and my topic was animals, and that was it. That was about the that was about the extent of my explanation. Um, I thought briefly, like maybe we can do band names that have animals in it. That would count. Um, but I think I think we just chose songs, right? 
Yes. Yeah. Songs with the word an, with an animal in the title of it somehow, or it could have the word animal. It could be. Did you pick Def Leppard animal? No, I thought about it. Okay, I did too. Yeah. It's a good song. Yeah. Okay. okay. Two on the nose though. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, and Tank's going to start us off with his, uh, with the songs that I chose for him that had animals in the title. I am. And I'm going to start with, uh, I'm going to jump right into it. And a question that I, I was going to ask, you know, I was going to text you and I'm like, no, we're going to do it live. All right. Um, number five, let's just fucking get right to it. Let's cut all the fluff off. All right. <laughs> oh boy. I'm in for it. I feel no, like number five, uh, partially yes, but unrelated to this first point. Oh. Um, so number, <laughs> number five is whip poor will by Magnolia Electric Company. By the way, I'm not surprised to see the desert cover over First question, what is animal about that? A whippoorwill is a bird. Oh, okay. See? <laughs> so there, there we go. go. <laughs> but, but, but the song title is hyphenated. Yeah, I don't know why. Okay. Well, that's what fucked fuck me up, oh, right? okay. Because I'm like, it's three words. It's whip. I spent at least five minutes. I'm like, whip, poor, will. I mean, what the fuck is that? I go, why what are they am- whipping poor will? What did right. what a poor will ever do? In my head, do? I'm like, what the fuck is... And, you know, I didn't, you know, I know you're fucking Audubon Society over there, so you know what it is. <laughs> But I'm like, I, buy, I spend a lot of money on bird seed. We'll just yeah. leave it that way. Yeah. I mean, but I was seriously like, I'm like, he's not dumb. <laughs> but what the fuck does that have to do with animals? <laughs> so that being said, it probably predisposed me to uh, hating it, to, to not liking it. Since I'm complaining, we'll just get right into the second thing. This whole thing about th- this fucking guy. What's his name? <laughs> Jason Molina. Jason Molina. All right. Okay. So he's Songs Ohio uh-huh. and Magnolia Electric Company. Uh-huh. Apparently both. Yes. Okay. So when I when I start looking for this song, it comes up under both names. Oh, I should have And it's told. like, you know what? No, 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 no. It's not your fault. Oh, I should have told you. Yeah. No, no, no. It's his fault. Okay. Okay. <laughs> what? Why? Dude, pick a fucking name. Yeah. I, this whole thing about like, look, I like arty music, right? Yeah. But I think people that make fun of music and artists for being too far up their own asshole. Oh. This is what they're talking about. Oh, okay. Like, Oh, I'm today. I'm this artist. Oh, sure. And now I'm this. Right, right. And if right. I if I feel this way, it's like, dude, who the fuck? Pick a name <laughs> and stick with it. It was super confusing. Like, yeah, this song comes up under both Magnolia and Songs Ohio. Yes, the the, the name Songs Ohio pisses me off. There's I, a there's a colon. Is that a semicolon or a colon? It's a colon. Yeah. And I was watching something. I was watching um, what's in my bag. The Amoeba Music. Um, YouTube thing where they take uh, bands shop at Amoeba and they say what they bought. Uh, I think I've mentioned it before and it's, it's, it's like a, a chance for them to, to out weird each other. These bands are like, look at this cr- fucking crazy ass album I picked. Anyway, someone picked a Magnolia Electric Company album and they talked about Songs Ohio, except he pronounced it Songs Ohia. Yeah. And his bandmate looked at him and went, wait, what did you just say? And he's like, yeah, I know. Everyone says that when I when I say it that way, but that's because Ohio is like Ohio is Ohia is like a flower, and that's how you pronounce it. And every single person pronounces it wrong. I'm like, that's bullshit. Then, no, it's, then fuck off. Then it's the thing. Then it's right. songs Ohio. Then you picked a stupid fucking band. Exactly right. It's like, dude. Because okay, so first of all, just be your name, okay? I'm already not crazy <laughs> about the whole. Okay, it's me. Like going all the way back to Trent Nine Inch Nails. Yeah, right? like yeah. okay, that's fine. But the whole thing about, like, okay, why are you not your name? If you want a stage name, fine. Yeah. If you want to be not a, a normal name, yeah. okay, that's fine. Yeah. But, dude, fucking pick one. Well, it, yeah, it, I get look, it. Aside from my own fucking, and I'm and I'm having a shit day, okay? <laughs> but aside from that, <laughs> like, even from a marketing standpoint, I don't get yeah. it. You, you build up a following, and, and the people don't even name. know that it's, I don't get it. It's weird. It's Chaps weird. my ass. Yeah. So, that fucking said... <laughs> This this fucking guy, <laughs> Magnolia Electric Company, or fucking Tom, or Songs Ohia, or whatever his name is. <laughs> All right, I don't like his voice. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, and I and I know why you like it. Yes, and I respect that. Okay, and I agree. It gives it personality because it's we things don't sound overly processed and perfect right. and whatever else. Right. I get it. Yeah. All right. Same thing with Neutral Milk Hotel. Oh, that good. Okay, I can right. see that. I, I get the vibe of that. It's yeah. like I know why people like it, but I just it, don't like it. I can't handle it. Yeah, I, I can't handle. I it. I can see that. 
That being said, um, I do like the music. Okay. And the guitar is great. Yeah. It's got a good warmth to it. Um, I just, I, I the, the voice just throws me off. Um, okay. And I don't, I, the lyrics I didn't really get. Yeah, they're kind of, they're pretty vague. Yeah, I think this is another one of those things that if I if I knew more, it would. You know. I think he's painting with broad strokes, right? Just kind of painting like this verse is this imagery, this verse is another. Yeah, he's probably busy changing his stage name <laughs> between verses. <laughs> All right, so so that was number five, who admittedly is probably a victim of of a bad start to my day. So, All right, that's number five. So at number four. I have Me and My Dog by Boy Genius. Sometimes I still do Something embarrassing I never said I'd be alright Just thought I could hold myself So it's the return of Phoebe Bridgers. Yeah, I'm a big fan. Yeah, I was like, first I heard the voice. I'm like, nope, this is, and then I, you know, yeah, check the lyrics and everything. Um, So I like that. I like her. Um, And this is, you know, I feel like when we talk about harmonies, 99.9% of the time it's positive. Yeah, I would agree with that. Right. In this case, I don't like the harmonies. Oh. I think they would have been better off letting her sing. Oh, okay. Uh, not that it's negative. It's just, it could have been better. Okay. Um. And the drums and the guitar here, the, the mix of the music is, it's so generic. It's like nothing is. Oh, okay. I, I don't know. I feel like it could have been just like, just let, let it be kind of ambient and the voice. Oh, and never um, even bring in all that don't stuff. Don't even bring it in oh. because you bring it in. It's like, it comes in. And I'm like, okay, that literally sounds like stock footage. Like what, what was the point? Oh, okay. Um, the lyrics are really good. They're really raw. Um, I always end up, you know, down these rabbit holes of what do they mean? Cause again, we're working with, we're both working with new material here for the yeah, most part. Right. And we don't know what it is. Right. It's actually about, uh, it seems to be the general agreement. It's about having this, uh, a breakup puts her in a bad place mentally. Mm-hmm. She goes to a show, has mm-hmm. an anxiety attack mm-hmm. and then starts wishing that she could be with her dog. Who's no longer around, right. which is super fucking oh, sad, super sad, which again, it doesn't, you know, this is what ruined my fucking day. <laughs> You're welcome. The light went off. This is why I'm having a shit day. Because I wake up, I make some coffee, and I got to hear about this poor girl who had a panic attack, and she just wants her dog, and her dog's dead. So, happy Saturday. That's right. What does it say about me that I chose these songs? Yeah, yeah. nice. And then you fucking give me one of these fucking Magnolia. <laughs> God damn it. Now you're going to keep doing it just to piss me off. I may. Yeah, I know. Yeah, well, just remember, Kid Rock has an expansive you've always, catalog. You've always got Kid Rock in your back That's pocket. That's true. <laughs> yeah. I do. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the lyrics are really good, though. And like the one line where she says, I want to hear one song without thinking of you. Like, mm. oh, God, it's just yeah. fucking, I think we've all felt that, that at some point. That kills you, right? Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. a tough one. So not bad, but uh, number four out of the ones that I got. At number three, I have Fragile Bird by City and Color. It's not lost on me that uh, City and Color is yet another example of some fucking guy yeah, who says, I'm going to give a name different, but I give him a half pass because I read why. And uh, so his name, I believe, is Dallas Green. Mm-hmm. And he was just uncomfortable calling, saying, here's my name. It's the name of the album. Oh, so City and Color is the most plain way you could describe his name. Oh, I had no idea. Right? That's amazing. Yeah. I Dallas- thought I had- Green. I thought it had some because he was in a band called Shit. Shit. No, I think he's in like he was in like an emo band that was like fairly popular. Yeah. And I thought he was trying to step away from that so he wouldn't use his own name or something. That makes way more sense. But that that's where City and Color. It's literally. Oh my god, that's great. You know, like if I were to say you know biblical military vehicle, that'd be, you know. <laughs> <laughs> which I think will be my my new porn pseudonym. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. So. I at least have credit for coming up with something that is at least referring to his actual name. Right. Um, but it doesn't bother me nearly as much as fucking Song Zohia, though. <laughs> uh, 
Um, <laughs> so the song itself, um, great retro vibe without sounding dated or cartoonish. Mm, okay. Um, it sounds fresh and lively and not like, you know, some songs are like D light being so over the top, like disco oh, sound. You know I what I mean? See, like a parody almost. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Really like the song. Chorus is really good. Chorus. I love the chorus of the song. It's beautiful. Yeah. The layered vocals, great guitar solo. Uh, guitar oh. solo with good tone. I mean, it's not comfortably numb live in Pompeii, but <laughs> it's uh, it's it's got a great fuzzy tone. Um, mm-hmm. So there's a lot that I like about it. And it's, again, a funny back-to-back here that it's about a woman having nightmares. Mm-hmm. And he's basically trying to be there for her. But uh-huh. at the end of the day, is like, all I can do is be here for you. Right. Yeah. Good, solid. I'm definitely going to check it out some more. I do believe the album cover here, too, I recognize as that's a, that's got to be a field in Kuchenhof, Holland. Oh, really? Yeah, I'll show it. I, okay. I've been there. I've seen it. And okay. I can't imagine there's a okay. whole lot of places in the world that look like this. Okay. Um, you should check out, he does a cover version of Nutshell, Alice Ooh, in really? Chains. Nice. And his voice is incredible. He, There's any number. There's hundreds and hundreds of solo acoustic shows that you can find of him on YouTube. Because that's mostly his, mostly the band is almost solo acoustic stuff. Like yeah. this, this has a lot, it has a full band, but um Highly recommend. Oh, that's definitely because I mean, yeah, I love that's that whole EP from yeah. Alice in Chains. I love that. And I learned about him. He's Canadian. So he, mm-hmm. what, right when I stopped listening to radio, he, uh, they play him on, on uh, the river, which is a local radio station here based in Windsor. And they have to play a certain percentage of Canadian artists. Mm-hmm. So they played city and color a lot. So, oh, all right. At a numero dos is Thunderbird by Hermanos Gutierrez. had a uh, a hearty laugh when i pulled up the wikipedia page to, okay. le- to learn about these guys okay. uh, they're brothers it's yeah. literally the translation of the, <laughs> right. the name of the band but the the wikipedia page starts off describing them as a swiss latin instrumental band whoa and i'm like of course come on <laughs> what of course that i chose a swiss latin <laughs> yes that that's half of it and half that just anyone would casually go oh, they're swiss latin yeah right <laughs> Can't you tell that? Can't you, don't you get the Swiss influence yeah. in their music? Oh yeah. It's, it's, it sounds like cheese. Uh, yeah. Swiss mother, Ecuadorian father, mm. uh, living in Switzerland, but frequently going back to Latin America. Oh, okay. That's how you end up with this sound. Okay. Yeah. Yes. But it feels very much like a modern Western soundtrack, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. you know, and the, the guitars really work as a substitute for the vocals to the point that I don't see how vocals would not ruin this. I agree. Like putting work, there's no scenario that putting human voice in here would make it better. It would just throw it off. I agree. Um, you know, Even we, if it was in Spanish. Right. I mean, we all know that piano is typically, you know, it's like the it, the instrument that most closely replicates voice and mm-hmm. that's why it works that mm-hmm. way. But I think there's something kind of unique here about how the guitars have done that. Mm-hmm. But just a great vibe all the way around. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, you know, considering this is number two, uh, you know what it feels like? Huh. Yeah. What does it feel you know like? What it feels like? Huh. Uh, it feels like a coffee. <laughs> okay. Coffee. Um, sitting under a covered porch right after a rainfall on a Sunday evening in late April. Ooh, that's a pleasant experience. Yeah, you know, like the, the rain has stopped. Yeah. The sun's peeking out, okay. but it's about to go down. Okay. So it's kind of over on the horizon. All right. You got a nice hot coffee. It's cool out, a little yeah, coolish yeah, you know, out. You're okay. Just, you're just relaxing. I like it. Yeah. All that's right. That's what it feels like. Nice. Yeah. yeah. I found these guys on a tiny, they just did a tiny desk concert. Or anyway, it just popped up recently. Um, I think this album came out last year. Yeah, no, very good, and uh, this is a definite album purchase. Yeah, the whole thing is exactly like this, this album. Yeah, it's just... (laughs) It will go right next to Sus in my collection. Yeah. Ambient country. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, the playlist challenge, by the way, is putting a severe dent in my music budget. Yes. So that means number one is Weird Fishes slash Arpeggi by Radiohead.
have a, a bit of a complex relationship with radio. Yeah, I was going to say, I, this surprises me. I, I figured it would. Yeah. Um, I don't, I generally don't fuck with Radiohead. Yeah, you just give them the respect that they're due. Exactly. And just like, exactly. It's like, I get it. Yeah. It's just not my vibe. Not for you. Yeah. So there's part of me that feels like you can't have Radiohead on a list and not have it be number one, just out of respect. <laughs> right? Okay. Well, I hope you didn't. You no. wouldn't do that. No, but that's not the case. Yeah. I mean, okay. you know how you know how seriously yeah. I take my rankings. <laughs> you do. Right? There's you lots do. of cutting and pasting, moving I, it around. I believe know. it. Um, no, but of the five songs, I mean, it's just, it's the, the best of the five songs. Okay. And All right. That's the interesting thing with me and Radiohead, and I'm sure someday it'll finally, you know, click, break. click and break yeah. over. But there's no denying the quality is, is too easy of a word to put on it. The, the complexity, the uniqueness mm. that mm-hmm. it, you can tell there's something going on <laughs> right? that is more than the usual. Yeah. Um, and as long as it doesn't strike you as offensive, right. it's hard to not get into it. Now, speaking of offensive, not a big fan of Tom York's voice. Many people aren't. And right. I, I, I can see that. So he doesn't come in until one minute into this song. Oh. So I was getting my hopes up. Oh, you thought it was an instrumental? It was instrumental. <laughs> I get to like 50 seconds. I'm like, oh, we're home free. This is going to be good. And then I'm like, oh, fuck. All right. Um, that being said, I mean, it's a it's a super interesting mix of tempos and tones. Mm-hmm. I think that I mean, if you just listen to the guitar and the drums, I I mean, again, I'm no Rick Beato. <laughs> Who, my my goal is to mention Rick Beato at least once every episode. He, now. We need to have him in our in my basement oh, at some point. We do. Yeah, I bet we can get him. Yeah, he's in Atlanta, right? Whatever, we'll go to Atlanta. Rick, we'll go to Atlanta. Rick, we'll come we to will, you. We will come to you. Yeah. Teach we'll, us. Take we'll, us on your wing. We'll invite Killer Mike too. <laughs> right. We'll fucking smoke down and talk about <laughs> pentatonic scales. <laughs> right. Um. No, but the tempos, the tones, it, again, it's, you could tell they're painting with more colors than the average band. Mm, okay. Oh, that's really eloquent. It really was. I just made that up. Yeah. Well, well yeah. done. Yeah. Hey, uh, Radiohead PR, you're, you're free to use that. <laughs> yeah. That's what they need. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if only we could get the word out. <laughs> so we'll respect our musicianship. Right, we're for, just, we're one break we're away. We're not just pretty faces. Yeah. <laughs> um, the lyrics are really good. Um, kind of bittersweet with, with notwithstanding the reference to being eaten by worms, which you know, was yeah. the only, the only uh, you know, uh, ghastly part of it. Mm. Um, drumming is really good. I always love good drumming. Uh, there's a breakdown in the middle, especially that I think is a musical highlight for me. Mm. Um, but yeah, that, that's really all I have to say about it is that it's, that's kind of the magic of Radiohead that I still am not a huge fan, but it's like game respects game in a way, right? Like, yeah. you know, it when you see it totally. You know, I, I was looking I'm like, well, it's it's the best of these five songs. It's just they make good songs, even if they're not my kind of songs. Yeah, they're good songs. It's probably how I feel about Rush. Probably. It, or that, hopefully by the time we're done recording all these, it, it's, yeah. it will be how you feel. Right. Yeah, it lines up like I can't disrespect them. Just. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Radiohead always sat, you know, with Fish and I mean, to some extent, Grateful Dead of I get it. It's just not my jam. Yeah, sure. Um, and but I, I do think you're probably going to break me down before this is over. Yes. Like we're, I think we're getting pretty close. I mean, I literally have no one to talk to about radio. I know nobody I know likes them. I know zero but, people, but every time I sample it, um, you know, I get a little bit closer to, to getting on board and I need some new stuff. So nice. I think we're getting there. Awesome. So yeah, that's number one. Cool. And I okay. now throw it back to E who masterminded this topic. Yeah. Uh, the first animal related song I'll, I want to talk about number five in the rankings Number five for me is Little Bird by Annie Lennox. Did you have that queued up? Did you know? I, I have my finger over it. Okay. <laughs> uh, the first thing I wrote down was I've always been, and I never, I don't know if I've ever said it to you. I've always been a bit perplexed by your affinity for Annie Lennox. Really? I don't. She's got a great voice. I don't connect with her in any way. Okay. Um, I don't know why. I, yeah. and, and, and I think I actually even just wrote that down in my notes. It's like, I don't get why nothing grabs me about her music. That's fair. And never has. I really dislike sweet dreams really i dislike it wow so maybe i'm predisposed to not liking other stuff okay um but this song 
I don't hate it. Um, I would just never choose to, to, to listen to the, it. This is, no, understandable. I mean, this is very much in the same vein as when I gave you boom like that from Dire Straits. Oh, this Alpha. is leaps and bounds above that. Right. But, yeah. but the the process of giving it to you was oh. the same. It, oh. was, it was going through my library, <laughs> oh, looking okay. for something that fits. Okay. It goes, what the fuck is he going to say about that? <laughs> okay. You know, knowing you probably won't like it, but yeah. mostly will be just have that confused look like, why? Yeah, I know it. Which it, is it, a great Annie Lennox song. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, Jesus. No, it's not. That's my point. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, this was a single, though. I, I vaguely recognize it, right? It was a single? Yeah. Okay. Um, I will say, and you'll understand this, uh, listeners, as uh, this my, my rankings go ahead, that I listened to this fourth out of the five songs that Tank gave me. And after the three that I had listened to, this was the song, the structure of the song and how very, um, not formu- formulaic is not the right word, but how it's, how it's just a standard arrangement. It's a standard pop song, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, and all that yep. kind of stuff. It was welcome after the three previous songs that I listened to. And, and it'll make more sense in a minute. So um, that was a relief. Um, and that was just luck of the draw. I figured I owed you a short song. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, the chorus where she's going, where she's doing the ooh, ooh thing. Is she supposed to be being a bird? I hope not. Oh, I don't know. I, okay. But I hope not. Okay. <laughs> Cause if she, either way, I mean, I don't like it either way, but I think I'd like it less if she was trying to make a bird sound. Yeah. Too much vamping. That's one of my things is uh, I hate when very good vocalists yeah. feel the need to really go over the top. So okay. just, just sing. Yeah, sure. You know, um, Oh, another note. I mean, just a curiosity The I don't know what part of the drum it is. There's a hit in it that sounds like a, the, uh, the hit from true faith by new, new order, which we talked about in a previous episode. Yeah. Like it's a, like it might be a canned drum machine thing it's that has been used in multiple songs. It's probably the, the gated drum sound. Okay. Which was huge. It's like, it's like Phil a Collins kind of like inadvertently invented it. Okay. In the early eighties. Okay. It's, it's the way it's recorded and mastered. It kind of like cuts off. Yes. This, yes. yes. That's it. Okay. Probably gated drum. Okay. Huge in the eighties. Okay. That's what it reminded me of. Yep. Anyway, it was my number five. Understandable. <laughs> number four uh, will be When It's Raining Cats and Dogs by PM Don. If I'm looking for you. My first note about this song is that the synths um, betray the era that the music was actually recorded in. It sounds older, like the synths sound from the eighties and they're a nineties group. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was kind of, but, but actually the synths aren't bad. Uh, There's actually some like Depeche Mode elements to it, which I, which I kind of like, I'm not crazy about Depeche Mode, but I I respect what they do. Um, So that I didn't mind the lyrics. I don't understand. I don't know what raining cats and dogs has to do with any of the rest. Like Mm -hmm. raining cats and dogs is not a, good thing it's raining a lot but there's no necessarily negative i mean i guess if you don't like rain anyway i didn't understand the the that being the title of the song i think he says yeah part of the course is i won't mind what does he say when it's raining cats and dogs i won't complain and i won't mind okay (laughs) all right great like so you can tolerate weather let the (laughs) I was just, I didn't get it. Lyrically, I didn't get it. And the other thing I can't help but think about is like, um, I always think of what these guys look like when I listen to them. I don't know why. Because yeah. because of that whole hippie vibe and because the one dude's so gigantic. And yeah, like, it's, like a, it's like a job of the hut vibe going yeah. on. Yeah. Um, boy, does this, this was just a reinforcement that this does not sound like the voice that comes out of that dude. No, no. At all all no like i'd be so shocked like if i had never seen what they look like if they weren't like an mtv era band yeah and i and i heard them first and then saw them i'd be like what the f-? it'd be like a rick astley moment like well, what is going on if you probably showed you know, well, most people today no one fucking mars oh PM that's true and you said which of these two guys is singing <laughs> yes exactly yeah not this guy no yeah no um but it's fine i mean just a standard popish song again i like the synths i thought they were pretty cool yeah, I mean, this is the uh, same album as I Die Without You, which is fantastic. Yeah, fantastic, yeah. right? So I think, I think this is kind of the victim of like, 
you have one song you know is going to be a mega hit. Yeah. And it's like, let's just get 10 fucking songs. I think on so. Here. Yeah. I think it's part of it. This was, I, I like, I like the music though. Yeah. Yeah. Like, but the, the lyrics are ridiculous. Okay. <laughs> My number three of animal related songs is going to be super fast jellyfish by gorillas. Oh, hell King Neptune and his water breathers. No snail thing too quick for his water feeders. Don't waste time with your net. Our net worth is set. Ready, go. Many no others. What? We be the colors of the mad and the wicked. We be bad. We be brick it with the 24 hour sign. Shower mind habits while you dine like rabbits with the crunchy, crunchy carrots. Oh, Gotta have it super fast. Oh, breakfast, you got time for. Super fast, super fast. I come in last. Which would qualify both by name of the band and oh yeah I just realized that I'm better than I thought <laughs> well done all right so I like weird as much as the next guy this is a weird song yep uh, it starts off with it sounds like one of the dudes from De La Soul is going to go right into a verse and then he gives he delivers one line and then does not finish that line and it was very off unsettling um. Do you know the the group, the Avalanches? They're like a DJ group. No. They're, okay. There's a song called Frontier Psychiatrist, which is like, they're known for like putting, like if you think they, uh, the Beastie Boys had a lot of samples in Paul's Boutique, this is just like to the millionth degree where the, the entire album is all samples, weirdly arranged. Um, a bunch of like children's shows and like 50, like stuff from film and from TV and found stuff. Anyway. It was kind of like that at the beginning. Like, what are all these samples all about? And yeah. I, I was very, like, I couldn't find a footing in the song. Um, and then that actually does get to a verse, to the verses, which are about food of some sort. And <laughs> I, I looked it up and it seems to be either a comment about how, about packaging pop music or something like that. Like how um, it's supposed to be very... Uh, formulaic or something like that i didn't get it i didn't get that side of it or it's literally it's just about pe- like um food or i don't know or super fast jellyfish about yeah. i i don't understand it yeah. I, I didn't get it i like de la they deliver they deliver on like the verses sound cool i don't know what any of it means um the beats fine um and then you get into the chorus there is a very there's a um it's a drastic change from the chorus from the verses to the chorus when damon albarn comes in and actually is singing it like his tone is way different and it, that part is actually kind of cool they're mm-hmm. putting two weird things next to each other which i appreciate but i kept thinking like i don't think i understand what gorillas are like <laughs> well, not the animal i think i fairly right. understand <laughs> well well either a primate <laughs> like is the whole thing a joke no I, but i think i think well two things i think one is by definition they're abstract okay it's like they're I think they're the music equivalent of abstract art. Okay. Right. Where you walk into a gallery and it's like, you know, someone pissed on a canvas. Fuck (laughs) is that? I'm supposed to think it's amazing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's part of it. But they were at it at their core, a visual concept. Yeah. Right. The whole whole thing was, we're going to be like the world's first cartoon band. Right. Sure. So I I think it's always been visual first and the music was maybe almost more of an excuse to do it. Okay. All right. That's the way I take it. Yeah. I just don't understand it. And I never really got into gorillas. I, I wasn't into bl- that much into blur. So maybe it's a Damon Albarn thing. Like I just don't get no. his aesthetic. No. That's possible. But. I think gorillas is it's album after album of home run swings. Oh, that like Clint Eastwood. Yeah. Connects. Sure. Become iconic songs. Yeah. You know, largely thanks to Dell. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's just, it's a whole lot of, Hey, let's try this. Yeah. And it that's, doesn't, that's what it sounds. Okay. Yeah. You put it really well. Yeah. That's what it sounds like. Let's try this this time. Right. Which not surprising if you have a guy who's in a successful band, yeah. has another band that's like, here's all the shit I can't really try with my successful band. Right. Exactly. Yeah. We yeah. damage the reputation or yeah. Right. Lose fans. Yeah. Okay. Oh, this song was featuring Gruff Reese. Is he in super, super furry animals? No idea. I know. I know the name and I feel like he's in a band called super furry animals, which I've never, like, I always see the name. I'm like, Oh, I should listen to them. And then I think I play a minute of their songs and I don't like them. And then I forget what, who they were again. Probably doesn't help this song. Yeah. No, I don't even hear them. All all I hear is Damon Albarn and the De La Soul guys. At number two for me is going to be dragon by Lou Reed and Metallica. Are meant to be servants Are meant to be dismissible objects 
one fucks with. One fucks with. Poor pitiful creature. Shocked it's number two, by the way. <laughs> Okay, so the first thing I wrote down for this song was, I hope this isn't the song that you care really passionate about. It is not. Oh, God, what a relief. Yeah. Not that I'm going to shit all over it, but just that I, I don't get it. And so you might be asking yourself, dear listeners, why is it ranked number two if you don't get it? I know I am. Because yeah. um, I can kind of respect it as an exercise. Right. Um, the riff is great. Yes. I mean, it's undeniable. Um I watched, uh, how I listened to it the first time was I watched like, it was a performance on like Jules, a Jules German Hub. TV show. German TV show. Yep. Yeah. That's uh, so I didn't even hear the studio version, but Lou Reed's reading off a teleprompter because of course he is like, this is like abstract poetry, right? That he has not clearly memorized and I wouldn't expect him to, um, man, is the band into it. Mm -hmm. They are really fucking into it. Like as if it was just one of their original, it is their original song, right? Musically. Yes. Musically. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't understand the lyrics. I don't think I'm supposed to. Is the Do you know, is it written from the perspective of a person and then from the dragon? Is it like two different perspectives in the same song? Is there even a dragon? Like there's a, no dragon. There's no dragon. God damn it. So, I, I mean, I, my understanding of this varies. And, and I, I think I might subject you and our listening audience to a full episode about Lulu one of these days. But um, the whole Lulu thing. So Lou Reed and Metallica met at Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Okay. Backstage talk and, and Lou said, I really like to work with you guys. And they okay. said, we really like to work with you. Okay. So that's where it started. Yeah. And then later he was like, okay, there's this concept project he had in mind. And it's, it's a play, a German play. Oh. And it's this, this prostitute. Lulu is the titular character as a prostitute. The oh. entire album in some form refers to, or a lot of it refers to this. Okay. And she's a, a prostitute. And okay. it, again, there's, I'm not going to try to really break it down, Yeah, but that's the general, that's the vulva of which he speaks. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I know. Right. There's some weird choices for I lyrics know. here. He says, uh, the smell of your armpit, the taste of your vulva. Uh, <sighs> yeah, I, I get it. Like I've, I've read, like I was an English major. I let, a, I read stuff that was dark and right. Like poetry like this before I, I get it, but I, I don't know. Like, I don't know how I'm supposed to connect with it other than just be like, oh, this is an exercise in him getting stuff off of his chest in a, in a poetic, um, metaphorical way. And he's got, he gets like, you know, one of the most well-respected, uh, yeah. you know, metal bands in the world to, yeah, to it, help him. The phrase Kotex jukebox, like, oh, I just, it makes me so fucking uncomfortable. So I get this whole thing and I'm proud of Metallica, not that they give a fuck, but I'm proud that. It is such Lulu is there to their fans. It's like Nickelback, right? It's like the ultimate joke. It's okay. no matter how bad they make it's like, well, at least it's not Lulu. Yeah. But never once has the band backed off or okay. said we're. it's like, we, yeah, we did it. Cause some bands do. They'll say like, yeah, oh, yeah this was oh, not I'm, a good time for us. Like, no, we we're proud of it. Wow. And okay. So it is what it is as an exercise. Again, I know this is yours. I knew I was going to step on this a little bit, but <laughs> it is a really acquired taste. Yes, I could see and that. The song is 11 minutes, 10 seconds long. It is. On top of that. Every bit of 11 minutes. Of yes. 10 seconds oh, long. you feel it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's exhausting. It and is exhausting. This whole album is that way. Oh. And there are, it, it oscillates between somewhat listenable and, and very unlistenable. And even I, who will make every excuse for the album. Yeah. There's four or five tracks. I don't even bother. Okay. I okay. Can't, I can't handle it. All right. That being said, this is one that if I had to pick, is probably the best it is this one. It takes a long time. Okay. It does. And I, I by no means am I recommending you do it. You have better shit to do. <laughs> but what, what the, the thing that I do love about it and the reason why I wanted to see what you thought about it, and I knew I, it's almost impossible to feel this way the first time through. Yeah, for sure. It, it's the nuance that as the Lou Reed, as the narrator, his or it's the urgency with which it picks up. Okay. At the beginning, he's talking about her. He's speaking. In yeah. the middle, he's yelling. And by the end, he's frantic. Okay. And the music backs him up on that. Yeah, sure. He goes from, you know, the way he, and the way, even the way he drops F-bombs, like, you know, that part is really well done. Is it, is the juice worth the squeeze? I don't know. <laughs> right? Because it is 11 minutes and it's a lot of sounds like, you know, yeah. incoherent old man ramble. It does. It does. Um, 
I don't know. If you have, I don't know, 40 minutes to kill throughout the rest of your life, you know, you give it a few more listens and you might be like, okay, I, now I get the vibe. It's Maybe. a vibe. It is a vibe. It's a vibe sure. and it's not an obvious vibe. No. And, and it may not be worth, it may not be worth it. Right. Um, but, I will probably make the decision right now that it's not worth it. Probably but not. I don't know. Again, yeah. I respect it as an exercise. Exactly. Go go for it, man. You're fucking Lou Reed and Metallica. Right. Do whatever you want. Exactly. Yeah. No. And I'm glad you see it that way. But yeah, I agree. It's uh, the biggest apologist such as myself. Yeah. I it took me a year to even like some of the songs. Okay. I mean, when I was watching the performance, I thought if you, if you didn't know anything about this and you're watching it for the first time, yeah. cold, you didn't know much about Metallica even, or much about Lou Reed. Oh no. Okay. Strike that. If you knew about Metallica and you knew about Lou Reed, but you never knew that they talked to one another or they yeah. never did this project and you saw this video today on YouTube, you go, that's a deep fake. Like, yeah, there, there's no possible way these two right. people, these, this, right. this song happened. Why would this be happening? <laughs> right. And if, and if you didn't know, I was thinking if you didn't know either of them yeah. and you turn it on, you'd be like, like, why is this guy in the band? Because <laughs> right. these guys are shredding back there. Right. And, and then is this, is this their dad? <laughs> right. Is it like he paid for the instruments? So they have to let him, <laughs> they have to listen to him. <laughs> right. And they're just back there making the best of it. <laughs> Uh, anyway, that's yeah. my number two. All right. I uh, think, I thank you on behalf of Lou Reed and Metallica for being that patient with you're you. You're welcome. And my number one choice was Whale and Wasp by Alice in Chains. actually didn't know this was the name of the song i know this album very well right i've listened to it a ton of times it's i mean by far the alice in chains album i've listened to the most and i didn't know this was the name of the song yeah outside of uh i'll stay away and no excuses i i never know what the other yeah, ones are called yeah. i just know that i like them. yeah um and i like this one a lot i mean it um God, we use the phrase vibe and I feel like it's like a shortcut, but there is something about at the atmosphere that this song creates the, um, all the, 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 the delays and the echoes on the guitar effects. Um, it, it, I don't know how long the song is, but I feel like it takes you on a journey throughout mm -hmm. the song. Like there's different kind of phases of it where I think a cello comes in about halfway mm -hmm. through and it completely sort of changes the feel of the song in a really good way. It's only two minutes, 37 seconds I thought it long. was short. It yeah. felt, yeah, it, right. Um, um, the mood, I would say, like at the beginning is kind of foreboding, like something's going to happen, potentially something bad. There's some darkness going on. And then when that cello comes in, if it is a cello, if it is indeed a cello, um, the, the whole mood shifts to be sort of light. And um, I was picturing like the animated um, version of Lord of the Rings, like some sort of weird medieval-ish England type, vibe which is not this band at all anyway it was something i pictured like this could soundtrack a weird animated movie oh um and there was some sense memory going on here because as soon as the song even before the song was over i knew what the next song in the album was mm -hmm. i could start hearing yep. it in my head that's a an artifact of a bygone era when we listen to full albums straight through because we only had the physical media um and that does not happen to me much anymore. And that was kind of a nice feeling. It was like a warm hug. Like, oh yeah, this is what the song that comes next. Mm -hmm. um, I, it's, it's, it's lovely. Uh, yeah. it's, it's a great song. It's There's not much to say song. about Yeah, it's a great song. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Did you think that was going to be my number one song? Yes. Got it. I thought that would be number one. I thought Dragon would be five. And oh. it, we would have a, a okay. stern talking to. <laughs> um, no. No, I, I kind of, I mean, because it, it is so beautiful, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, it, it was basically a song that I knew was good and four examples of what is he going to think about this? <laughs> okay, that's fine. I encourage that. I also expected to argue about dragon being a mythical animal. <laughs> you were like, hey, I said animals, <laughs> not mythical creatures. No. Yeah. Uh, no, so that uh, that wraps up this playlist challenge and this episode. And we'll be back next week to do it all again. So come back and join us. Yep. See you then.